Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And in Daniel chapter 9, verses 9 to 10. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Okay. This morning, as I said, welcome. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. For those that don't know me, I'm Louise. And um, I'm pleased to be able to, to lead the service this morning. So our announcements, our um, new Menangle website is there uh, for all the information. If you would like to go to that to find out about Bible time, music time, church news, etc. City of Tears. So equip women. Okay, so 18th of June. All right. Are there any other announcements? Any special birthdays or anniversaries? No? Okay. Then let us continue with our service. The Bible tells us not to hide our sins from God, our Heavenly Father, but to confess them with a repentant and obedient heart, so that we may be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought to admit our sins to God at all times, and especially when we come together like this, to give thanks for the benefits we have received from him, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his holy word, and to ask him to supply whatever we need. So let us approach the throne of our gracious God with a true heart in full assurance of faith and pray together. Merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the schemes and desires of our own hearts and have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done and we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who repent according to the promises declared to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live godly and obedient lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God desires that no one should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. We confess our sins in response to his call. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. Teach us through your word and equip us for every good work for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going to have our first Bible reading and Beth is going to bring us that Bible reading, which is Samuel, and that will be followed by Carolyn. We're going to read 1 Samuel 12, strap in, it's a long one. Excuse me if I fluff it a bit. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 12. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and grey, and behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am, testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken, or whose donkey have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, or from whom, whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it, 
Testify against me and I will restore it to you. They said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, he is witness. And Samuel said to the people, the Lord is witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them, then your fathers cried out to the Lord and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord, their God, and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you lived in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God, when the Lord your God was your king, and now, behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants uh, to the Lord, pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may die, for we have added to all our sins this evil, to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet you do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that can profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and will, I will instruct you in the good and right and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading is from Matthew chapter 7 and it starts at verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them 
will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. My name's Gary. If we haven't met, I'm a member of Norellan Anglican, and uh, it's great to see you here. I've been here a couple of times, but it's good to see more people here this morning. I wonder if you've ever made a dumb decision. Thank you. That's the exact response I was looking for. Of course you have. We've all made dumb decisions in life. Uh, perhaps this next picture is an example of a dumb decision. I would suggest it is. The strange thing about dumb decisions is sometimes dumb decisions have big consequences and sometimes they don't. You never quite know. We've seen over the, first, uh, over the last couple of weeks that Israel have called for a king so they could be what? Like the other nations. Israel wanted to be like everybody else. Saul has been made their king. Saul on the outside was a very impressive man. Yet he is an enigma. Uh, on one hand, when we first were introduced to Saul, he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He was impressive physically. And yet when Samuel goes to anoint him, Saul couldn't be found because he was hiding in the suitcases. This is the man that the people had as their king. Israel had made a dumb decision. The overriding issue that confronts us is that this king is the, peop is the king that the people requested. They have rejected God. And this man Samuel, who's so much is in this book named after him, is about to put himself on trial. He's about to put himself on trial for this request for a king, but not so much himself, but we'll see it will be the Israelites who will stand on trial. But he puts, him, he puts himself first on trial because he knows he is innocent. This chapter before us today is quite strange. It's quite strange because we'll find that after these trials that we will see, we will find that we all have free will. We have free will to make decisions. And yet we will be reminded that with these decisions come responsibility and consequences. And yet on the other hand, we have a God who we will see will be completely trusting and gracious and just and righteous, and for his name's sake, will be faithful. So let's pray and we'll look at this chapter, chapter 12 of 1 Samuel. Let me pray. Father God, we do pray that you'll bless us as we look at your word, as we sit under your word, as you speak. We thank you that you're a speaking God, that your word reveals who you are. We pray that you'll continue to reveal yourself to us today, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Samuel puts himself on trial, let me read the first five verses. 1 Samuel chapter 12. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and grey. And behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am. Testify against me before the Lord. And before his anointed, whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me and I'll restore it to you. They have said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. 
And he said to them, the Lord has witnessed against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, he is witness. So Samuel goes through this process of getting them to answer the question, has Samuel done what the Lord has asked him to do? Has Samuel asked for a king? No, he hasn't. Has Samuel defrauded them? Has he taken what is not his? Has he taken from them? And of course the answer is silence. Samuel has not done these things. And the questions that Samuel have posed all come within a framework of power. What has Samuel done with the power that God has given him? Has he used it to abuse them? No, he hasn't. Power is a very interesting thing. And I think we find it hard to trust people in power because most people in power use it for their own benefit. They use it to line their own pockets, to take that's something that's not theirs and use it for their own good. And some of us, if we were to be honest, would do the same thing with power. That's how power works. But power is much more subtle than what we think, you see, because we are often in power struggles without even realising it. There is often a power struggle between husband and wife. There's a power struggle often between parent and child. There is often a power struggle between employer and employee, between citizen and non-citizen, between male and female, between English speaker and non-English speaker. You see, sometimes we exert power without actually even saying anything or out doing anything. We are just in a position of power. And we often misuse that power to crush others. What Samuel is doing here is signifying that with this change of leadership will become a change of how power is used. In chapter 8, Samuel warns the people that if you ask for a king over you other than God, this is what will happen. Your king will take your fields for himself and the fields that he does leave for you, he will want a tenth of all the profits from it. He will take your children and he will put them in the war. He will put them in chariots to fight on behalf of him. He will make your children become his cooks and his perfumers. Everything good, he will take from you. And at that time, Samuel said, you will call out to God and he will not answer you. And the people say, ah, you know what, we're all good. I really don't think it's going to happen that way. So they say, we want a king. And Samuel here puts him on trial, which is my second point today. Let's read from verse 6. And Samuel said to the people, The Lord is witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed before you and your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them, then your fathers cried out to the Lord and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the king of Moab and they fought against them and they cried out to the Lord and, he, and said, we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jeroboam and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you lived in safety and when you saw that Nahash the king of the Ammonites came against you you said to me no but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king and now behold the king whom you have chosen for whom you have asked 
behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Samuel here piles up the evidence against the Israelites. He does it by showing them their history. He says, time and time again, when God has done something great for you, you forgot. Your ancestors and you forgot. This repeated pattern of sin, then trouble, then crying out to the Lord, and then rescue and good times, and then forgetting, and sin, and crying out to the Lord. This pattern over and over again and all the time throughout the Old Testament, we're pointed back to the time when God brought the people out of Egypt, when they were nothing, when they were not a, not a people, when they were slaves. God called them out and rescued them and time and time again they forgot. They forgot what God has been doing and continues to do and this fulfils much of the Old Testament story. We want to be like everybody else. We only have to go back to chapter 7 to see that when the Philistines came to fight with Israel, they called out to God and repented and God rescued them. And here in chapter 12, they've forgotten that already. They're just like their ancestors. And when Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, comes knocking on, on their door to come and conquer them, who do they want to answer the door? God or a king? They say, a king. Thank you, despite all the evidence of God caring for them. Now, if you were a jury in this case, I doubt you'd have to sit for too long to find the guilty verdict. All the evidence is piled up against the Israelites. They don't have a leg to stand on. And yet, this passage takes a strange twist. Point three is, they get a warning. They get a warning because of their guilt. Let me read from verse 14. Samuel says, if you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before you, your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain and you will know and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. The people are guilty because they requested a king. See, it's not wrong to have a king. It's that they asked, it for, a, asked for a king other than God. God was already their king. And the evidence is weighed, the verdict is given, and the strange thing here is they get a reprieve. It's obedience to what they need to do. Obedience will deflect the punishment that is due to them. And we see that in verse 14. When Samuel says, if you and the king follow God's way, it will be well. It's a bit like being placed on probation. You are guilty, but here's a reprieve. If you continue to do the right thing, the punishment will not come. But on the other hand, verse 15 says, but if you do not follow the Lord your God, God's hand will be heavy upon you. It's pretty clear there's just two alternatives. You either follow God or you don't. And to further demonstrate why they should follow God, Samuel says, I'm going to ask God to send thunder and rain on you this very day, on your harvest. Now, the point is here that it is the middle of summer. It is harvest time. Storms don't normally occur in the Middle East in the middle of summer. 
It's not that they never happen, it's just it's a very rare thing. But the thing here is that God sends it on them that very day. And rightly, where we read that the people fear both God and Samuel. They have witnessed the power of God once again. And the people say to, to Samuel in verse 19, please call out to God on our behalf, for we have added to all our sins the evil of requesting a king for ourselves. And Samuel says to them from verse 20, don't be afraid, even though you have committed this evil, don't turn away from following the, God, following the Lord. Instead, follow him with all your heart. Worship him. Do not turn away. Even though you've been following these useless and worthless things that can't profit you, continue to follow the Lord. There will be some of you who will have friends or family who are not following the Lord and you can see that it will only cause pain. An ungodly life will only lead to destruction. And if you've had the opportunity to talk into their life, often they will look at you with a blank face. Uh, yeah, I know what you're saying, but I'm just going to continue to do this and that. Yeah, I know it makes sense, but this is sort of what Samuel's up against here. He lays all the evidence to the Israelites, but still... He sees a whole lot of blank faces. He says the option is simple. Worship the Lord with all your heart. Now on one hand it is very simple because there is only one God and he speaks through his word and he sends his spirit to change people and to give them a new heart. But on the other hand it's extremely complicated. It's complicated because we've still got to live with our dumb cho choices. Those dumb decisions often come back and plague us all our life, just like with the Israelites. Did you notice that even though the Israelites repented that God still kept Saul as king? He didn't take Saul away? See, the important lesson there for life is that repentance doesn't take away responsibility. But it's also complicated because we're all born into sin. Our first desire is to live for ourselves rather than for God. We don't want to do the simple thing of worship the Lord. Unless God reaches down and takes out our old heart and replaces it with a new heart, we have no hope. We can't do it by ourselves. Other people can't do it by themselves. That's why we pray. That's why we call out to God to, God to change people's hearts. Now, the good news from this passage is found in these last verses. Being found guilty is not the end, which is my fourth point. Let me read from verse 22. Samuel says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me... Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. The constant throughout the Old Testament is that the people were faithless, but God was faithful. And it continues right through the Old Testament. So much so that the more the people were faithless, the more God was faithful. And God was not going to abandon his people despite their sinfulness. And why is that? Verse 22 tells us it's because of his great name's sake. God saves people because of himself. 
because of his name. He will not break his covenant. To do so would mean that he's not the Lord God Almighty. You see, it is always God's choice to save. It's always God's choice to make a people for himself. It was never the Israelites' people a choice to be God's people. Even on their best days, it was always God's choice. And the same as it is for us. You may think you chose God, but you didn't. God chose you, not because of you, despite of you. See, I want to say that this is the sweetest of doctrines because it means that when we fail, when we disappoint, when we even deliberately sin, we are still saved. You see, because it's the greatest comfort to know that my salvation is not up to me. Your salvation is not up to you. It is God's work in you. I read during the week in a devotion I was doing from Michael Jensen, who's the rector of St Mark's at Fowling Point, and talking about misunderstanding of what it is to be devoted to Jesus. He says this, you'll see the words come on the screen. It is not the depth of our affection for Jesus that saves us. It is not that we lo so love Jesus that he so loves us. We do not trust ultimately on the persistence of our feelings about Jesus to save us, but rather we trust on the fact that he will persevere with us. Jesus perseveres with us despite us. Now this, of course, does not mean that we do not need to be devoted to Jesus. It does not mean that we need to trust any less. It doesn't mean that we have to don't do this or do that. In the New Testament, it is clear that we are called to continue to work on our faith, to continue to chip away on the things that are causing us to sin. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's this long line of great heroes of the faith from the Old Testament who were called into God's kingdom and would continue to live by faith even though they didn't see some of the things that God had promised. Those things were that came to their descendants. But they still hung in there and they're called heroes of faith. And if you read chapter 11, before it says the person's name, it says, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Enoch, by faith, by faith. And then we get to chapter 12 and it talks about this witness language again. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith you see we work hard at our faith not to be saved but because we have been saved we do it as a response the glorious truth is that we are saved and then held in salvation by the Lord himself. See, our devotion, our love for Christ, our faith in him, our service, our very life is always as a response, as a response to being saved, not in a hope that we will be saved. We come from the guilty side of the ledger to the innocent side of the ledger because of the blood of the Lord Jesus. It is worth living for, it is worth serving for, and it's worth giving thanks for, and I'm going to do that now. Lord God, we do thank you that you have saved us to be your people for your great name's sake. Father, help us to take great, take great comfort in the fact that we can't save ourselves because we know that even on our very best days, we're not the people that you want us to be. Father, we pray that we all take that fact and trust in it. We do thank you for the Lord Jesus. We pray that we'll continue to live for him 
day after day. And we pray in his name now. Amen. Thank you, Gary, for bringing us that sermon this morning. Let us continue with the Apostles' Creed. And we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. We will now have prayers which Craig will bring to us, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Um, a few things just keep in mind in your um, prayers this week. Um, continue to um, pray for the nominators. Um, they're still searching uh, for a new minister. Um, we've had many leads, many interviews, and many fallbacks. So, um, but keep um, us um, in your prayers. Um, we're still reviewing a new list of names, which hopefully that will be promising. And also continue your praise with our Bishop um, Peter Ling. Um, he's also working in the background, um, looking after our interests. And um, also with um, Jim Douglas as well. Oh, and also, Steve Davis had his major operation last week. And he's not doing too well. He's got a lot of complications from it now. Um, especially some um, infections and he's sort of on borderline between life and death and I believe he's more on the life now so please uh, continue you know with your prayers for him and for Ros and family. The prayers I'm using is going to be coming out of the Sunday service book. Um, I thought it was a great prayers to use and that's what I'll be using today. Let us pray. Almighty God and merciful Father we give you humble and heartily thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We praise you for creating and sustaining us and for all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your amazing love in redeeming the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, giving us grace and the hope of glory. Give us such a sense of your goodness that we may be truly thankful and may praise you not only with our lips but in our lives by serving you in holy and righteous ways through Jesus Christ our Lord, to him with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory. God of everlasting love, who provides all things, we pray for all people, make your way known in them by your saving power among all nations. We pray for the welfare of our church here on earth, Guide and govern it by your spirit, so that all who call themselves Christians may be led in the way of truth and hold the faith of unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Dear Heavenly Father, we do pray for, our, for us, Lord. Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide us. Father, you know us more better than, than what we know ourselves. So, Father, for the things that um, we are... We know that we are doing wrong, Lord. We just pray that uh, you can just guide us and to um, open the truth before our eyes so that we can repent, Lord, and change our directions so that it's more godly and um, what you want us to do in our lives. And, Father, we do give great thanks. Um, probably a bit too much rain at the moment, but um, it's so much better than being in drought. But, Father, we do pray for those who have been affected by floods. Um, especially those who have um, not only uh, lost loved ones, um, but also have lost um, property. And Father, we just pray that uh, to, con to continue to give wisdom to those in authority who are, um, are out there in the flood areas to help these people, that they do it wisely and do it effectively, Lord. Father, we also pray for Christians around the world. 
Christians in other countries, especially where there is suffering, danger and persecution, those who are sent out as missionaries. We pray for Christians in our country, the Anglican Church of Australia, this diocese, Kinesco, our Archbishop, and Peter Lynn, our Regional Bishop, and for this parish, our Acton Rector, Jim Douglas. Strengthen your people for those of their witness and work in the world. Fill your ministries with your spirit, that they may be faithful, preach the gospel, and minister your holy sacraments. Unite in the truth of all who confess your name, that we may live together in love and proclaim your glory in this world. Father, we especially pray for um, Steve Davis. Father, we just pray that, um, um, that you continue to give wisdom and guidance for um, his doctors or specialists. Father, we just pray that um, you just work in his body to, um, um, to give the healing that he needs and give the peace that you know that um, you're working for him. Father, we especially also pray for Ros and family as it, um, it must be a very stressful time to see um, Steve um, being so um, ill in hospital at the moment. We also pray who suffer for the sick, for the poor, the depressed, the lonely, the unloved, the prosecuted, the unemployed, and those who grieve, and those who care for them. Comfort and heal, merciful Father, all and all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. Give them a firm trust in your goodness. Help those who minister to them, and bring us all into the joy of your salvation. Accept our prayers for Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sing against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us now continue in prayer and take a moment just to uh, pray for all of those people that are on our hearts. Uh, everybody has uh, their own individual people that I'm sure need your prayers. So let us take a moment to do that and then I'll finish off. Father, we bring all of our prayers before you and we ask that you hear them. Amen. Let us continue now with our, our responses. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory cover the earth. Keep our nation under your care and guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Send out your light and truth, that we may tell of your saving works. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for we put our trust in you. Continuing on, eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this week in love to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you to everybody who took part. Please join us for morning tea in the stables. And thank you Gary especially. <laughs>